Would you please take up your Bibles and turn to Exodus chapter 19? We're going to hear from the living God. Exodus chapter 19, that's page 60, or if you've got one of the blue larger print, it's page 71. Exodus 19. Let's listen to God's words to us. On the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain while Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him out of the mountain saying, thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore... If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken we will do. Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak to you, and may also believe you forever. When Moses told the words of the people to the Lord, the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their garments, and be ready for the third day. For on the third day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people, And you shall set limits for the people all around, saying, Take care not to go up into the mountain or touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall be stoned or shot. Whether beast or man, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people. And they washed their garments. And he said to the people, Be ready for the third day. Do not go near a woman. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain and Moses went up. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down and warn the people, lest they break through to the Lord to look, and many of them perish. Also let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. And Moses said to the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you yourself warned us, saying, Set limits around the mountain and consecrate it. And the Lord said to him, Go down and come up bringing Aaron with you, but do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. Amen. And take up your Bibles again and turn back to Exodus chapter 19. Now just last week as a family we were, we were down in London celebrating my sister's birthday. It was, a, it was a great trip and we have spent many, many, many hours on trains, uh, both getting down there and travelling around London. And, and when you're surrounded by hundreds, it really was hundreds of people travelling, there's just something I love to see and it's kind of those, those little moments of kindness. Um, I don't know, like when a 
a young man with kind of headphones pumping stands up and lets an older lady uh, sit, have a seat. Or when a, a stranger helps a single mum carry her buggy up the steep stairs. There's, a, there's a, just a beauty, isn't there, to those loving acts. It's deeply attractive. It kind of brings light and life. It, it lifts burdens of people. It, it brings smiles. It's, it's there in those really small, often mundane, yet great acts. And it's like that because we know it's the call of God on us all to love him and to love our neighbor. And although through God's common grace we do see glimpses of love in our society, we're actually a society not really sure what a godly life looks like or how to reach one. You know, if you asked your two next door neighbors what the good life is, they'd perhaps give you very different answers as to what that would be. And if you ask why, why they thought that was the good life, well, then the floodgates just open, don't they? Because we, we don't really know why we should live in a certain way. It's just kind of what we do, isn't it? And as we look around us, we even see that even with its standards, our society is far from meeting them. But So what about us? What about God's church, God's people? Is that what we're to be like? Are we, are we to be a community that shines and shows this kind of to love? Are we meant to shine and be different? Are we meant, in a word, to be holy? Well, here in Exodus 19, it's a glorious passage, and God begins to give us an answer to that. God's people, have, they've made it out of Egypt, they're out in the wilderness, and they've made it to Sinai. And God is about to give them the law. That's chapter 20. He's about to give them his wonderful way to live. But here in chapter 19, he comes close. And he comes close to show them who they are and also who he is. And that makes all the difference. And the big thing they need to know this is this holiness is the vision for our life because it's who God is. I'll say that again. Holiness is the vision for our life because it's who God is. Now, holiness is it's kind of that idea of difference, being other, distinct in a wonderful way, a bit like a, a rose among thorns, like an oasis in a desert. And as we get to grips with, with holiness being about God, well, then so our lives can begin to change and become that loving life that brings joy to others. And, and God, first of all, points to us in this chapter being the holy nation. And then we'll see, secondly, he points to himself about meeting the holy God. So let's take that first one, being the holy nation. Let's read from verse one again. On the third, uh, on the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out for Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain, while Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. What a gl there are glorious few verses, aren't they? God declaring his steadfast love and, and covenant over his people. And as this declaration kind of comes to a climax, we see what God has got for them. Verse 6, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. There's God's vision for the life of his people. It's to be holy, to be this holy nation, distinct, a nation of holy living, godly. Yes, they're just, in one sense, a group of people, a nation like all the other nations. But just to be like the other nations, well, that is not their calling. It's not their destiny. They are to be glorious. They're to be beautiful in holiness. And that holiness, if you notice, comes through obedience to what God says. It's there in verse 5. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, holiness is, is living as God has called us to live. Now, there's a couple of things we need to notice from what God says here. First, when it comes to holiness, we've got to get the order right. Sometimes we think God's rescue of us is dependent 
on our obedience to him. You know, God will love me if. If I'm good enough, then God's going to save me. And actually, we're a society that thinks that this is the only way. You know, we're, we're only honored and respected if we've done good things. We're valued only if we're productive to the economy. And other religions are the same. You know, a Muslim believes he has to earn his way to, to God. Perhaps you've thought that. God's only going to love me. He's only going to let me into eternal life if I've done enough. What a burden. What a weight to carry. But that is not the order here. Verse 4, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Here's God's people. They are already his covenant people. They are already chosen, already receivers of God's promises. They are already God's firstborn. And they've already experienced God's salvation, his rescue. They're out of Egypt. They're free from slavery. They've been rescued in order to obey and live out God's commands. It's not the other way around. This is the gospel order. What God has done comes before what we do. As the Apostle John puts it, we love because he first loved us. Or as the Apostle Peter puts it, once you have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy, and then he says, keep your conduct honorable. Mercy before what we do. And there's no greater way of seeing that order than here with the Israelites. God had to rescue them from Egypt before they could come to the mountain of God. They had to be saved in order to come and hear the law. It's the gospel order. But they are rescued to obey. Verse 5, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, God really does have a better way of doing life. His covenant requires faith. That's how we're saved, faith alone. But true faith is never alone. It displays itself in our life through obedience to God's voice, through keeping his covenant. So secondly, we need to see that this obedience, well, it has wonderful impacts on God's people. It shows us holiness is a good thing. Verse five, you shall be my treasured possession. Now in one sense, that's already true. They've been rescued. They've been set apart from other nations already. This word here for treasure possession, it's, it's used elsewhere of a, a king's personal possessions. You know, a king owns everything, and yet here is something deeply close to him, personal, special. I know, perhaps like a, a crown jewel that sits protected, but admired in his personal chambers. And it's as if, as God's people obey, they shine more and more like that jewel glistening with covenantal glory. They please their God. They bring joy to his heart. Isn't that incredible? Treasured. Being a holy nation, it's a wonderful thing. Being a treasured possession of God. But it also has impacts on others because as they obey, they also act as a kingdom of priests. Now priests we're going to see later in in Exodus are kind of the go-between between God and his people. Aaron would represent the people in God's presence and yet yet also represent God to the people. And if the whole nation is to be the kingdom of priests, well, now there's a really wonderful outward focus here. God's people are to, to mediate God to the other nations, represent him out there, bring them to God. Just as we saw with Jethro last week, the nations turning to God. So in other words, Israel are to be a blessing to others. They're to be a light They're to display the holiness and beauty of God. They're to make his name known to all. All they come across and bring them to him. Just as Jesus puts it, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who's in heaven. What a vision. It's a vision of holiness, isn't it? As we obey God. So we live out our calling. We, we live out that relationship with God and we shine out to those around us. We're being the holy nation. And this just shows us that holiness, it's not an optional extra. It's not an add-on. It's not like something at the checkout that you can kind of add to your purchase if you want. No, it's what we're saved for. Now, 
But of course, as Christians, we know we're not perfect. And we've seen Israel certainly wasn't over the past few weeks as they've grumbled, they've rebelled in the desert. As we're going to see, they had to be kept at a distance from God, a sure sign of their lingering sin. And we know our sin is true too. As Christians, we, we don't stand here as models of perfect living. But we do know, we do know there's a better way to live. And deep down, we long to live it. We long to be that holy nation, don't we? But I don't know about you, but I think it's amazing how sometimes we can be tempted to say something like, oh, that's sin, it doesn't really matter because I'm forgiven. And we try and kind of brush over it, just carry on regardless like it didn't matter. I don't know, perhaps it's a, a habit of yours that you actually quite enjoy indulging. And yes, we're forgiven in Christ, of course, but we've forgotten we're a church called to be a holy nation. I wonder if sometimes we begin to th- um, just to be kind of satisfied with our current level of living. I think I've recently been a bit like this, just a bit complacent. I'm not doing anything really bad. You know, to use the words of, um, of Jerry Bridges, my sins are kind of respectable. I have respectable sins. You know, they're, they're kind of tolerated by others and by me. So I'm, I'm no longer bothered by them. It's just the way I am, I say. But actually, the way I am, those sins, is what brings ugliness to life, isn't it? They hurt others. They can bring fear, worry. They, they point people away from God, not towards him. But we can be, in God's strength, by his spirit, we can be a holy nation, can't we? That's what he saved us to be. May we join in with what he's doing. And it's important to say it's us We're a nation, a kingdom. It's a responsibility for each one of us to care about the holiness of us all. Just think about how the writer to Hebrews puts it. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. It's challenging, isn't it? How to stir up one another to love and good works. Let's be people encouraging each other to greater holiness and love. And that's not done through judgmentalism or harshness, but with Christ-likeness, gentleness, encouragement, example. That's being the holy nation. That's what it looks like. But why is holiness who we are? Why is this our identity? Well, it's because of the God we worship. Being the holy nation, well, secondly, it all comes from meeting the holy God. Being the holy nation, it comes from meeting the holy God. That's what this has all been about. Virtually the whole of Exodus has been this. Right back from Exodus chapter three, God promised this to Moses. When you've brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. It's here in verse four. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. And then in verse 17, we get it really and truly happening. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. What a phrase that is, isn't it? To meet God. God wants his people close. He's called, uh, called them to be his people, his treasured possession, to be in a loving father-son relationship with him. But what kind of God is this? Who are they meeting? Well, we find and we find that out by saying quite a big problem emerged. You might have noticed it as we read it. Verse 10, the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments and be ready for the third day. Something isn't quite right for the God's people. They're not consecrated. That means they're not pure. They're not holy. They're not right to be in God's presence. Something needed to be done to them or for them. Now, we're not sure what consecration means here. It's not recorded for us. Was it more ceremonial washing, like the washing of their clothes? Was it some kind of sacrifice? We're not sure, but something had to be done to get them ready. But then we see even that isn't enough, verse 12. And you shall set limits for the people all around, saying, take care not to go up into the mountain or touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. We get this problem repeated at the end of the passage. Verse 21, and the Lord said to Moses, go down and warn the people lest they break through to the Lord to look and many of them perish. So God's people were to meet God, yes, but they couldn't actually come too close. 
Rather than it being all joy and celebration, there must have been a real atmosphere of fear for those days. Just imagine it. Just think as parents, just let their kids out of their tent to have a runaround. The warning they must have given to those kids, don't go too close to the mountain. Or the shepherds, as they're moving their flocks around, looking for the next bit of pasture, really aware not to stray too close to that mountain. Also, they didn't die. What's going on here? Well, we're seeing the holiness of God, the complete and utter purity and glorious distinctness of God. God is one. He is infinite in love and justice, goodness and truth. So to have any sin in him, any sin in his presence that's left unpunished, well, then he denies himself. He ceases to be the true God. And if if his glory is to be displayed on that mountain, And in some way, people need to be kept back. Tim Chester puts it like this. It's as if the holiness of God is nuclear. If you want to approach a nuclear reactor, then you must put on protective clothing. And even then, you must not get too close. In the same way, if the people want to approach God, they must come prepared through consecration. And even then, they must not come too close. A nuclear reactor must be encased in layers of concrete, and as the glory of the Lord descends on Mount Sinai, the mountain is split into zones of increasing holiness and therefore danger. And then he concludes, Sinai leaves Israel and us in no doubt. God wants a relationship with his people, but God is also dangerously holy. Striking, isn't it? And we... We see this purity, it's dangerous holiness, this dangerous holiness then shown in in his glorious otherness. We see it so unbelievably powerfully in what happens when God displays his presence on that mountain. Verse 16, on the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain. What a moment. It's like a complete assault of the senses, isn't it? You know, 4D cinema, eat your heart out. This had huge quantities of smoke, like you're amongst industrial-sized fire. I assume there was a smell with it. There was fire on the top of the mountain in the midst of a great cloud. There's flashing of lightning. There's rumbling of thunder. Just imagine the noise. Rumbles and peals kind of echoing around the mountainsides. Then with this growing kind of harmony of trumpet blasts getting louder and louder and and the mountain begins to shake. Pretty rocks were falling and shattering. Just kind of take it in. This is a moment of absolute terror. No wonder. No wonder all the people in the camp trembled. Our God is no small deity or idol. He's not some genie you can kind of keep in a lamp when we need him. He is the God of creation. The one who cannot be contained by the billions of galaxies in our universe. Who cannot be tied down or controlled. Here is a power like no other. We've all been overawed by moments of natural power. I don't know, like a surging wave or a great storm or a strong wind or a blizzard. But these fade as we begin to see the the glorious one behind them all. His purity, his holiness. It's nuclear Meeting the holy God. This is the God we come to meet and worship. This is the God we bow before in the quiet of our rooms in the morning or speak to as we ride on the bus home. This is the God we sing to on a Sunday who speaks to us through his words. And this is the God we will stand before when his son returns in glory. This is the Lord, the God of all, the holy God. How holy do you actually think our God is? How mighty, awesome. He really is other to us, isn't he? Holy other, worthy of our worship, pure. 
No wonder people had to stay at a distance. May we never come to him lightly or, or flippantly. Because what's extraordinary is what the writer to the Hebrews says about us Christians. Because he says as Christians, as those after Jesus, we don't actually come to Mount, this mountain, Mount Sinai. This mountain where God's people are kept at a distance. No, he says this, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem and to innumerable angels in festal gathering and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God, the judge of all and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Now, did you hear it? We actually come to an even more glorious mountain, Mount Zion, the heavenly realm, the place of God and his angels, the place where his presence is displayed in perpetual perpetual glory. But did you hear who, by faith in Christ, we have come to? To God, the judge of all, he said, the Lord who revealed himself at Sinai. We've actually come closer to him meeting the holy God. And he's still the same God. He's still the God of terrifying holiness, dangerous, nuclear holiness. And we're still the same people in nature, people who need consecrating and keeping at a distance. So what's changed? How can we actually come to him? Well, it's that last bit of the Hebrews verse. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. Those are wonderful words. We have a different mediator. Now the role of the mediator was clearly needed in the Exodus passage. I don't know if you noticed, Moses, he goes up and down this mountain. He's 83. Again and again, verse 3, Moses went up to God. Verse 7, so Moses came down and called the elders. Verse 20, the Lord came down at Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. He's a clear mediator, a go-between for God and his people. He's the one who can come close. He's the one who hears God's word, who reports the people's words. But even in his role, he could not deal with the people's sin, could he? He couldn't bring them closer than the limits of the mountain. He couldn't consecrate them in such a way that they could come right up to the nuclear power of God in safety and peace. It's only Jesus who can do that for us. It's only the blood poured out by Christ that can bring us close. And he does. Jesus wipes away the sins of his people. He makes us righteous in his own righteousness and then brings us by his spirit to the presence of God. What an incredible gift to us. We we can approach the terrifying holy God And we can come in confidence, safety, and peace. We can meet the holy God. Now, we don't see him like the Israelites did in this display of power. Instead, it is something we glimpse in the present by faith, isn't it? As we meet with God personally, but all the more as we we come to him as God's people gathered together on his day, worshiping him as he's commanded. Right now, this evening, We have come to God, to the judge of all. We've come to a better, everlasting, unshakable mountain. And one day in the future, as the heavens descend to the new earth, we will be with God in glory. We will see his majesty in the face of Christ. We will see his holiness somehow through spiritual sight. We will meet the holy God and be safe forever. All because our Lord Jesus, our high priest, died and rose again for us. It's a wonderful gospel, isn't it? And firstly, if you're not a Christian here this evening, may the dangerous holiness of God show you you need a mediator. You do need Jesus. Otherwise, meeting God, especially on that final day, will be a day of fear, not of joy. But secondly, it's meeting this holy God through Jesus that makes us the holy nation we're called to be. 
Because if we get to come to this holy God, if we get to worship him with the angels every Sunday, if we're spending time in his presence through Christ and his word, is it any surprise that over time our lives become to look more and more like him? Is it any surprise that, that we as a holy nation begin to look like the holy God? Not in natural displays of power and glory, but in being distinct, in being pure, living lives that reflect his character. You know, we know that when we spend time with someone else, we begin to be like them, talk like them. You know, as a teacher, I got to know teenagers as well, and then I'd meet their parents at parents' evening. It's like, oh, that's why you say things like that. That's why you behave like that. How much more when we spend time up close with the holy gods? Remember what God called Israel to do, to obey my voice, to keep my covenant As we get to know this God, his voice begins to change our lives. His covenant begins to display itself in us. Holiness is the vision for our life because it's who God is. This is why Jesus came, to make us into image bearers of God we failed to be. That's why he rose. That's why he's pouring his spirit on us, all to bring us to God in worship and to transform us from the inside out. And so let's be people whose hearts are directed towards the mountain of God, who look to him in reverent fear and love, the holy God who brought us to himself. After school, I, um, after I finished school, I had the privilege of getting out to New Zealand to see family and travel around a bit. And, and, and the tallest mountain in New Zealand is down in the South Island, It's called Araki or Mount Cook. And down at its foot, there is this beautiful glacial lake. It's kind of cloudy turquoise in the sun. But just on the edge of that lake, there's this little church. It's called the Church of the Good Shepherd. The thing about this church is it's lined up perfectly. So inside, at the far end, there's there's the table and a small wooden cross. And behind that is a window, a window that looks right across the lake to Mount Cook. It's a beautiful view that gazes right up into the mountain. And it's a little picture for us. It's a picture of a life oriented towards the mountain of the holy gods, to where he is. Our view is on him. The eyes of our heart fixed on him because that's what we want, isn't it? To meet the holy gods. And as it's, it's as we gaze at him, as we know by faith his holy power, his purity, the fear of his might, the wonder of his love, it's then by grace we begin to change and be more and more uh, into his image. More and more our lives begin to blossom with the beauty of his holiness. Because holiness is the vision for our life because it's who God is. And then as we grow in holiness, we pray. Others might see our good deeds, and glorify our Father who is in heaven. Amen.